Okay, so uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, all the uh, speakers today are available for this discussion. So uh, that's uh, starting with uh, Daniel and Paul and uh, James, George, and myself. And then other people, I mean, everybody will certainly be uh, taking part in this, but I, I just want to make sure that those people are available. Yeah, so we're going to be recording this as well. And um, I guess this is the view that we'll see in the recording. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Are we ready? Let me take a view of the gallery. Yes. Okay, um, so thank you. This has been, at least for me, uh, interesting to hear all the different uh, presentations today. And uh, it, there's uh, a lot that strains our credibility, our cred credulity, but uh, at the same oh, okay. time, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, it really needs to be strained because there's there's uh, there's 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 a lot of strong evidence out there. Um, so uh, let, let's have a, a little bit of a discussion about that. Before we do, I'd like to talk about uh, the host for this part of the uh, of the workshop. Uh, that is the symposium, and that is the Society for Scientific Exploration. The Society for Scientific Exploration is a group of scientists who look at anomalies. They look at scientific anomalies that are not necessarily accepted by the mainstream and examine them fairly rigorously uh, using a, a, a thorough scientific approach. And uh, it's, it's an organization that I've found to be absolutely fascinating. The, the conferences for the SSE are more interesting by far than any those of any other organization I've been to. And so for those of you who may be interested, I suggest you take a look at the SSE, the Society for Scientific Exploration. You can, you can find us online uh, and you can join either as a full member, as a scientist or lay people as well, uh, can join as associate members and uh, help the organization also read the various uh, uh, publications of the organization, organization. And there are more symposia like this one on, on other subjects. Um, also, we, the Journal for Scientific Exploration is a rigorously peer reviewed journal put out by the society. And we are going to, uh, starting immediately after this conference, issue two calls for papers. One is a call for papers on um, advanced propulsion, as discussed in the first part of this conference, and uh, a call for papers on advanced energy concepts, as discussed today. And so all the speakers in particular are invited to submit articles to the uh, uh, Journal for Scientific Exploration, and you'll be hearing more about that in the future by email. Okay, so let's uh, have our little panel discussion here in which we uh, go over uh, perhaps uh, some of the questions that were raised today and also extend uh, the, the, the questions to cover related uh, topics. Um, and for this panel discussion, uh, I've got a little nasty timer, uh, which uh, I'll use so that all responses from the panel or anybody else, please be lim limited to as short as you can, under a minute if possible, but the beep will go off after two minutes, uh, just so that we can have as many different uh, uh, views as possible. So the first question that I'd like to ask of the panelists and then uh, have the, the, the general uh, audience as well uh, uh, give opinions on is what would it take you to convince what would it take to convince you that there was a genuine uh, second law violation 
what makes you skeptical and what would overcome that skepticism? Um, who would like to start on the panel? Well, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, from the, uh, uh, from the, the lab scale where I generally work, um, I, I want to reiterate that uh, applying the proper measurement techniques and the proper instrumentation, uh, which is uh, accepted by uh, the, all the people who have worked in this, these areas uh, from the micro scale up to the, uh, the lab scale, need to be rigorously adhered to and uh, <clears throat> that um, the application of the, the, the correct measurement systems, uh, including instrumentation, including the, the way uh, the experiment is uh, undertaken, and especially the provision of, of uh, control experiments is, uh, is required to convince me that there's something there. Uh, what we haven't seen uh, too much in, in the, uh, um, or emphasized as much as I would like in this uh, discussion is, uh, is the insta installation or the, um, the, the, the um, uh, change of the parameters, you might say, to include uh, control experiments. Control experiments that would normally be considered uh, uh, to not or to give the same effect but come from a prosaic source. So uh, that's, I, I try to always emphasize um, the provision of control experiments. Of course, I'm looking at it from the macro or the lab scale where it's relatively easy to produce uh, and consider control experiments. From the, mi at the micro scale, that's a, a different uh, kettle of fish. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Daniel. Yeah, um, adding, adding on um, to that, I, I think it would be very useful to have not just experiments, but a theoretical understanding of what's going on. Um, a black box is good up to a point if you've done sufficient number of controls. If you end up buying this device powering a, a phone or a TV or something from Walmart, you can probably trust it as being a second law violator because uh, if it's making money, and they spend a lot of time uh, perfecting the device, it probably works. But if, you're coming, if it's coming straight out of the lab, what, I, what I've been disappointed in in general is insufficient uh, theoretical explanations for what's going on. Um, and it's easy to kind of hide behind things if you, don't, if you don't have that. So the three basic pillars of science are so physics right now, where you have theory, experiment, and numerical simulation. If all of those come together, that'd be a pretty convincing package, I think comment on that. Philip Anderson came out with an article 30 years ago in Physics yeah. Today in which he said that uh, one of the problems in scientific research today is that we don't believe a phenomena if we don't have a theory for it. He said that's a mistake. We need the, the measurements to lead and the theory to follow. Well, yeah, it's, it's, I agree with that. I think, I mean, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, it, the second law is an experimental fact of nature. And therefore, only a, a, a experimental violation of it is sufficient to actually bring it down. But at the same time, in terms of convincing people, um, what I have found in, 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 in my life is that until you have a, a convincing theory, plus the experiment, people aren't going to even look at things, look at it carefully. Thank you. James, I think you were going to say something. Yes. So um, according to you know my result, we now really uh, think pretty convincing there are two type of energy processes. So the type B is uh, have a symmetric structure then nearly isothermally utilize heat energy. So now the reason is that I think uh, from the implication of this um, identification of type B is, you don't want to say change the second law. It's like, look at second law. Second law is based on idealized gas law. Right, uh, you have. I think you know. Remember the Carnot cycle. At least one of the uh, way of saying it. Okay, most uh, accepted. You have this uh, uh, Carnot cycle. Is PV? You know. You know this whole thing, right? It's a, a basic idea like gas law. So you, there, you are assuming idea gas law. Of course, the particle and more all three dimension because volume, right? It was three Ds. Okay, and there's no consideration of symmetric. You see that, right? It's considered all freedom, right? 
And then if you base on ideal gas flow, you cannot close your eye, I'm gonna apply everywhere. Now in biochemistry, we actually have like the kinetic, uh, in the kinetic, uh, uh, kinetic uh, theory called, um, you know, it's, uh, it's called, um, you know, it's well developed uh, for inorganic kinetic uh, uh, theory is based on certain assumption. We, we couldn't uh, apply that, that theory only to the cases where you uh, fit the, the, you know, the thing here. Look, for example, the kinetic, um, in our kinetic theory currently we accept we are teaching every year, cannot apply into a hemoglobin. That's another enzyme, right? It says so, because the enzyme have, you know, it's not fit that definition initially, okay? Now, you, you based on the idea of gas law, now you try to close the eye to apply everything, including when you have a symmetric structure. Now for our proton, you, you, you don't have a three dimension anymore. In the initial proton in the three dimension, right? You know, it's localized. Of course they are like in, in a, liquid water, yes they do. But when they are localized on the surface, it becomes two-dimensional. So your volume, you see, it's PVV, it's not exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then you're still doing that thing, and then basically you get a problem. So I will say, now we can understand these are natural occurring everywhere. We want to say, hey, you know, second law, you apply into part A. But type B, you don't want to say violation. We say, if you want to challenge it, we say challenge equitability. Or the universality of second law. You don't challenge second law, okay? Because second law is well, well done. It's you know we see ATP hydrolysis follows absolutely well, right? You know in biochemistry we see uh, some of who has follows yeah, excellent. I mean, yeah, I will say you know make sure that we understand uh, second apply to type A, but you have a symmetry. Be careful, okay? Yeah, you can apply it, close your eye, many professors does, then you'll miss very important things. I will tell them. Then people, okay. hey, you know. Thank yeah. you. I need, I need to cut you off. We're, we just want to get on to the next people. Sure, so, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, uh, I, let, let me also ask this question to Paul. Uh, so what would it take to convince you that there was a violation? And what would it take to convince you that there was a violation in your own lab? <laughs> you know, I, I'm when uh, Daniel, and, and you and I chatted, uh, you know, I've been, I mean, I'm not a big second law uh, expert, honestly. So I looked at, uh, you know, in my mind, uh, I kind of gave up on a lot of these second law things, in, in, at least in my area, because I look at um, just the Brownian motion phenomenon, which is kind of at the heart of everything I'm doing now. Here's this particle sitting in a constant temperature environment it's transferring its energy to the environment and coming to a stop. And then the environment is transferring energy back to it, giving it energy. And it's a cyclic process of, of losing energy, gaining energy, losing energy. I mean, you couldn't develop this model if you said, oh, I'm gonna stick with the, I'm gonna follow the second law and make sure that uh, at each step of time, this is, uh, this is followed. So. To me, I don't know, I kind of see it as a long time ensemble average, um, you know, requirement, not really something that is really guiding me or helping me, you know, uh, find answers to, to, the, to the problems I'm looking at. I don't know. But Daniel, you know, he has a, a strong opinion on a, a, a deeper input, I should say, uh, you know, in these things. Uh, you know, I, I, people ask me, you know, I, I say these things, they, that violates the Calvin Planck statement, but but well, yeah. I mean, you had to violate it to develop the kinetic theory of of the of statistical mechanics. So I, I'm a little puzzled by the whole conversation in that sense. In that at that level, <laughs> Daniel, do you want to respond? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what kind of response to be appropriate here. You know, I do have strong opinions. I may have, after all, I might not, Garrett. But um, the. I go back to the Kelp and Ponk form, uh, um, Paul, and, and, and just ask the question, can you set up a situation where you're getting work out of your system and uh, um, in a cyclic process, turning heat into work? And, and if it keeps going that way and your system cools and you're getting work out continuously and it keeps operating, uh, that's pretty much a second law violator, whether you want to say so or not. And and uh, I don't know. Are you are you are you? 
is that is is that possible with your device? That's a simple question. Can you do that? Well, well, I think when we analyze our statistical variables, uh, we we to me we definitely satisfy the first and second law um, in terms of the heat and the work and the energy. But on short time scales, you know, doesn't seem to be um, necessary. Right. Um, but but as, as far, Garrett, I'm sorry to if I'm being asked to answer. I'm kind of exceeding my time. So I'll tell you what, I'll back away and save my time for something else. And this this is a discussion that I believe is going to continue for quite a while. Yes. Uh, this particular issue. So let's. Yes, uh, I think so, so. Somebody else uh, want to. Uh, Germano. Does Germano has a way down? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's right. It's late at night. Okay, Garrett. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I share uh, pretty much the, the, the position uh, of Daniel. Uh, if we stick to, uh, well, my answer will be probably a trivial one. And uh, if we stick to the, the, the classical definition or a statement of the second law, the Planck and the, the Calclesius one, um, well, although I, I am more a, uh, of a theoretical physicist, the only way to, to convince me uh, of a genuine uh, violation of the second law uh, is seeing before me uh, a device that when switched off uh, generates a, a microscopic current and cools down the, the, um, the, temper, the, ambient, the ambient temperature around it. And uh, obviously it, it, worked like, it must work like this uh, uh, with no, no time limit. Um, in fact, every one of us, I, th I believe, will be able to, to build a machine like this one that works like this, but for a limited period of time. Take, for instance, a, a box with inside a battery and uh, what is called an instant, an instant ice pack. Okay, this, this device will produce energy and cools, cools down the, the, the ambient heat, but only for a, a very limited period of time. If we are able to, to build a machine, a small machine that uh, does this work uh, cyclically, uh, for me, this is a very, very good uh, uh, example of a machine that convinced me of the violation of the second law. Thank you. Um, so we need to show cooling. Um, any, uh, would other people like to address this issue of, of, of uh, what would convince you that the second law is violated? And again, please keep your answers uh, short. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, what Sean Wee Fan said to us on Wednesday, and he's one of the foremost experts on thermodynamics, and he told us that, hey, you know, detailed balance, that can be broken all the time, right? It's an ensemble effect. And don't worry about the detailed balance. So I think that goes to your work, Paul, and uh, what I, I kind of heard you saying there. So, but as far as like demonstrating that you violated the second law, I go with George, you know, hey, let's have definitive experimental proof. And uh, that's really hard to get to. I, mean, just, okay. right. I think it really has to come from the experimental side because mm -hmm. Entropy is so baked into just every theoretical model we have. I mean, I think it was Oppenheimer who said, you know, if your law disagrees with experiment, your law is wrong. But if your experiment disagrees with entropy, your experiment's wrong. And it's, it's so baked into at least how we understand these laws. So either it requires like fundamentally new laws or there's just like a basic misunderstanding of our theoretical devices that's going on. So I, I just, I don't see how it would come initially out of the theory. I think that's the big mystery, you know? Justin, I think you were going to get your hand up. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to build upon what I talked about before, that every model is a tool. So when you ask a question, and while you're violating a, this model, and, and we've already seen through different presentations that this model has changed, that second law has had many different flavors to it. Um, and certainly the, fla the common flavor is that they're talking about a closed system. And in and of itself, it says, well, energy is moving from one thing to another. So that sort of gives you an open system. So, so there, there, there's questions with how the, the principle, second law, second principle of thermodynamics is actually couched. Um, but then, you know, more importantly, it's that every model is a tool 
And that, so you're trying to get those different models to have certain properties. And, you know, conservation of energy is an important property, continuity, continuous space, you know, uh, uh, physical properties is another important property. So, so the whole thing is not to, the goal is not to say, well, it's violating the uh, second law. It's more of, can you create a model that has, it? we know at the atomic level, we know at the subparticle level, we know that these things fall apart. Um, there are, you know, over unity energy systems out on the road. I mean, like uh, HHO or as Maury King says, that it's really structured water devices that are actually powering trucks and they're actually saving money on energy. Um, so we, we know that there's lots of places where our physical models break down. And in all the presentations where I saw where people were actually pulling energy out are the same structures that I see when, you know, we're working with, you know, sub particle models or zero point or ether models, whatever you want to call it. When, when you look at them, all the properties that James talked about, um, you talked about, it, those are the same properties you see time and time again, you know, in research over the last 180 years or so that really seem to um, be pulling something from zero point or ether or what have you. Um, so it, it's, uh, I've said my fill, I think it's somebody else's time. Okay, oops, thank you. Um, okay, let me go on to, and just uh, to keep things moving, uh, uh, ask a, a different and related question. And that is, why are there so many misguided researchers working on energy ideas and technologies? Uh, uh, Hathaway Lab has gone through zillions of things and really found no strong evidence. Uh, Earth Tech International did. Say, similarly, Coolescence spent a long time looking in depth at cold fusion and LENR and found nothing. Why, why, why so many people in this field? Uh, so let me first ask the, the panel to answer if anybody on the panel wants to. I can, uh, this stuff, is this stuff being recorded? Yes. <laughs> Stop. Um, I, I can give a brief answer to that. It's called short memory and laziness. Uh, typically, the, the kind of researchers that I, I uh, have uh, come across or have come across me um, have tremendously short memories and the inability to consider that their ideas have actually uh, been uh, looked at and discarded in 1880 or 1859 <laughs> or something like that. So uh, there's a very uh, there's a there's a memory problem, uh, and I can go into all sorts of others. But that's the first thing that, that, that I want to mention about that. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on the panel? All right. Yes. Um, so. Um, to adding on, on that, um, I like a pause work. You know, pause work really uh, demonstrates type B, artificial human-made type B energy processes using Bologna motion and charging up. Now, his process is very clear. He had, you know, the doubt, you know, a pair of that is, is a symmetrical system, a symmetrical uh, component. So the whole system is symmetric, perfectly fit at the type of B type of energy process. So I was thinking, that when you communicate, you don't, so, you know, part of the flat off say, you know, what is second law? <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't, you want to say second law does not apply because you have a symmetric, you know, you can sign my paper, we already published. When you have a symmetric, you sign my uh, actual paper, actually Daniel helping me a lot when we published that paper. Um, you can sign my paper saying, you know, now we have understand there are two type of uh, process on earth, natural occurring. What you made is really a, a solid, authentic type of B process, human made. And also Daniel's uh, uh, epitope catalysis is also a valid type B energy, but human made, it's not natural occurring, <laughs> of course. Uh, so yeah, we need to communicate that because you say uh, challenge second, people say, oh, oh, you know, we, me, you know, this kind of turn off, those kind of feet, you know, uh, pseudo sign, you know, they immediately get that reaction. Now you understand there are two type of energy processes. The reason is you have a symmetric. You remember the second law came from, you know, you from the kind of cycle, right? We explain, I try to explain that in my paper to why, top, you know, you should not apply here. Yeah. So uh, then you actually take a very good list. So a symmetric is like is a necessary condition. There are other conditions. Also, Daniel also just in his uh, 
um, talk today, right? So those like, you know, you have to have boundaries, all that. It's, that's also 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 valid. But I think uh, asymmetric is, should be like the key criteria, you know, to see whether they're possible. So that's my point, okay? Don't be afraid to say <laughs> the technology does not apply. Don't be afraid because there they are people don't understand. So if we are not so trying to change the technology, Second, China second law, just like ideal uh, gas, a very good law, beautiful law, and apply many places. And we need that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Daniel, you, you, you had your hand up? Uh, sure. So the question is, why have there been so many failures? Because it's a hard problem, but also because too few people are working on it. And that has a lot to do with the lack of funding, uh, shame, and uh, uh, cudgeling by the scientific community not to look at these. Uh, because of fear of failure. I think uh, uh, people who are trying it now are, are trying things that many, in many cases could have been tried a long time ago. I, I, I often say that the epicatalysis experiment could have been conducted back in the 1870s, probably. It's, it's a 19th century experiment that had to wait to the 21st century to be done simply because people were not looking, did not look because they didn't think they'd ever find anything. So I think the, and the same would be true of, of Germano's ideas. Uh, these are ideas that could have been explored a century ago. So, so it, it's, it's a strange thing uh, that we haven't looked at it, but I think it has to do with the community of science venerating the second law so much that it's unpopular and unfunded to try to do so. Well, turning it around, why, why, do, why are there so many erroneous results, people who are believing that they actually are harvesting energy when they're not. Because they're not, because they're not doing the experiments well, or they haven't thought things through correctly. There are a lot of reasons. I mean, I'm not, I, I think uh, failure is part of science. And, um, and if you're not well educated and motivated and so on, um, then yeah, you can fail a lot more often. Um, but I find it surprising that when a second law challenge comes about, Almost nobody repeats it. In fact, it's it, ones in the literature have not been repeated. Uh, Paul's hasn't, mine haven't. I'd be surprised, Garrett, if anyone does yours for a long time either. People avoid doing these re repetition experiments. I would, I would, I would relish someone trying to to uh, um, repeat some of these experiments, but they aren't being done because the scientific community dissuades people from doing so. Thank you. Anybody else on the panel? You know, I can add to that. I, I, um, okay. mm -hmm. I, have gotten, uh, you know, not to brag or anything, but I've gotten a lot of funding over the years from the, from the, from my semiconductor work and my surface science work, you know, in the millions of dollars. And then when I started switching to, I, I know I like this problem, <laughs> you know, when I switched to, um, you know, basically the Brownian motion of graphene, uh, in some kind of energy. Uh, harvesting aspect of that. Uh, I've submitted a bunch of proposals, DOD. I've talked to DARPA. I know um, David <laughs> and um, NSF, of course. And, you know, there's reviewers that will review your thing and say, oh, hey, this violates the second law. We shouldn't fund it. <laughs> yes. So that happens. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll echo that. Uh, uh, I'd like to second that. Uh, I'd like the third that. And <laughs> but I, I think Garrett's question really was, why are there so many uh, garage people, for a better name, out there trying all these things like, um, like George pointed out, magnetic motors and this and that. And, you know, people seem to be really driven to find something like that. And that's a really interesting question, I think. Mm -hmm. And it you know, it, it seems to me that there's something out there, information, and, and beg my kind of metaphysical discussion here, something floating in the universe that seems to be like, wow, there's something, there's something, there's something. And we're all striving to find that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's going to land on one of us. But like Picasso said, well, inspiration needs to find you working, right? So when that inspiration comes, it's the people like all you doing the real good hard work that is going to solve it. So that's my two cents. I can I can add to that too. So so I um, when I published my paper in 2016, it was I noticed that the statistical properties of graphene had a heavy tail like a like a levee flight, a 
really a Lorentzian distribution, which is highly unusual, and got very little attention. <laughs> uh, when, I, when we basically said, oh, hey, you know that actually, since there's a high probability of high velocity movement, that may lead to an energy harvesting concept. It resulted in this huge, you know, press release, uh, you know, and a big, a big pickup in the community. You know, this big uh, all metric score where I was getting on the order of a thousand emails. So that I, there's something in the public that's interested in those types of topics versus these other types of topics. Also, um, White had a comment. His hand. Thank you, sir. It's been up for a while. <clears throat> Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. You know, I just uh, want to uh, comment on something launching off of uh, a statement that I heard Charles say a long time ago. Uh, this is, in some cases, this is all about bookkeeping and are we bookkeeping all the right things, right? When we're talking about uh, the, the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so that's kind of like my, my launching point for just a, a, a few small statements I'll, I'll make in, in 60 seconds or less. You heard me talk in my presentation, if you think about physics as a Venn diagram, right? Uh, there's two circles on the Venn diagram and they, they touch at a tangent point. One of the circles represents general relativity. The other one represents uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, so we know there's a more <clears throat> generalized understanding that we have yet to develop. Um, I mean, think about just from general relativity, dark energy and dark matter, 90 some odd percent of the universe, we technically don't even know what it's made of, right? There's a lot of models that are trying to explain it, whether it's mathematical or a real thing. <clears throat> and then just as a, a, a final point, you know, for hundreds of years, everyone in science worked to create purely analytic models because we didn't have computers to go through and, and model anything. And so a lot of uh, simplifying assumptions have been made that baked into a lot of things on how we look at the universe and how we model it and how we, how we study it. Uh, and so, but computers have kind of changed that. And so even in the last 50 years, I think we're seeing, you know, new tools and opportunities to go explore things that we, we couldn't have explored just, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, in, in our work with studying the, the quantum vacuum with these little Casimir cavities that we're building, and we have to use thousands of CPUs to, to study those. So uh, all that to say, and, and this closing statement may not be popular with some here, do, do we really need to <clears throat> fret too much about the worry of toppling the, the second law of thermodynamics, right? Because there's there's still a lot of things that we don't know and a, a lot of things we have to make sure we understand and, and salute uh, Charles Chase's uh, tenant. We'll at least call it that, the Charles Chase tenant. Are we, are we doing all the proper bookkeeping? Um, so I, I'd like to just respond to that. Um, no, we certainly don't need to topple the second law. And I, I for my technology, I hope that we were not. But the problem is, uh, as, as Daniel and in, in a different way, um, uh, uh, Paul Thibodeau has says, uh, the world won't recognize us unless we, uh, if we appear to be violating the second law. And so the second law is tackling us. It's not that we're necessarily needing to tackle it. That, that's uh, not entirely true, Garrett, uh, when looked at from the investor standpoint. Uh, and I've been, uh, as I have mentioned in my discussions, been a sort of go between, uh, between uh, moneyed parties and uh, new inventions. And uh, investors in the commercial world look at, use different metrics to determine whether something is, is uh, efficacious, uh, or, or, or not worth uh, pursuing. And so uh, you have to sort of shift from a, uh, a, a clinical view of uh, whether something's actually possible from looking at a textbook and saying, gosh, the second law says this is not gonna work, so I'm not gonna invest in it, to gee, I'm getting some results. Someone is making a bit of progress here. Um, is it worth continuing that progress either using a DARPA grant or uh, from some a, a private foundation or an individual or somebody like that. So you have to use a bit different language also. Uh, an investor really doesn't care whether you're violating first or second law or any other law for that matter. So Does that the thing produce something? So that goes along with what Daniel was saying a little earlier that if, 
if you have a product that's profitable. Hey, Gary, Gary, I'm sorry, Gary, could I just put a, a small sentence on what you said? <laughs> and, and Paul, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think neither you nor Paul need to go through and show that you're uh, violating the second law of thermodynamics. I think it just goes back to the, as you know, Charles talked about, it's bookkeeping and making sure you understand how can you set up some asymmetries, right? Because at the end of the day, my, my coffee cup always tends to get cold, right? So, um, Just to, uh, as a counterpoint to what George said, uh, for our technology, we've brought it to several different um, larger groups to, looking uh, for collaboration. And what they usually do is bring in an academic to evaluate whether this could possibly be true. And the academic, you know, those academics uh, <laughs> are tend to be very, very conservative. So let me actually modulate the question a little bit. Why are we so damn conservative? And is it appropriate? Let me add on that. Uh, conservative I think is necessary for science. You know, I actually enjoy, actually appreciate George and Martin, you know, in, in, in Germany doing that kind of verification. That's important to maintain the scientific integrity and test out those false ideas. Now, so the whole thing, why the second law part of that is not accepted. Anybody says, why the Chinese second law, why the second law, they can reject you. The Department of Energy, actually, they have a statement that any same wide second law, they were not fund. So this matters, you know, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it is, so this is going to take a long time. So there's a part of history because in the past, you know, like uh, and the second law come out, nobody understands. They're thinking the old idea, this whole second law is not false and they can make perpetual machines. So many of those things <laughs> is not true. Okay. It's it, indeed a false ideas law. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that's get very bad names. So mm -hmm. then, uh, so that as soon as they say, you know, perpetual machine or why the second law, they will say, uh-huh, you're faking science or you're, you're, you're no good. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. So it's going to take a long time to come in. So now hopefully we now understand there are natural processes. They are top B, we now clearly identify, you know, on the equation, very clear. There's not, no ambiguity there. You were on equation, you said explicitly RT is there. And so, and now you can say the reason why, because second law from idea gets law. You don't have a symmetry going on here, okay? <laughs> you do, so you be careful, ha uh -huh. So that, that's why we say here, you know, we second law is a wonderful law. I will say it's like uh, all the testimony. Part B, you know, that process will be uh, a new testimony we did write about. So first, uh, the first, uh, you know, the, the old testimony is variable. Don't reject second law, don't topple second law. Okay, just like I did guess, so they're valid. So you say, why the second law? Of course, everybody gets very upset, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if they don't understand. The first word, they're gonna, huh, no, they're not gonna fund you, okay? And I think we need to communicate better. <laughs> that was strong recommend. We don't want to say top or anti or challenge second law. We'll say there are two type of processes you apply in these places, not everywhere, sir. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the message. <laughs> second law is valid. Don't top it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to bring in, if I could, five new topics, and they might shed some light, um, okay. if that's at all possible. I think historically, we have to look at Babbage. Don't forget when Babbage created a computer and how many decades went by before it was even looked at again. Just think about it. You could have had a computer had the French government not pulled back the money the military was giving Babbage to develop it. That's one concept. The second concept is the concept of how simple things are once you know how they work. Look at all the people who try to fly. Look at all the attempts of doing a flying machine. The Wright brothers looked at the birds, learned a lot, and now the average kid can make a little glider that flies that they could have never done years ago. And you can understand how it works. Look at simple things that that, that are actually incredibly simple, a vacuum tube, an x-ray tube. Uh, back in the days when I first would, in the 60s, did lasers, they were just very simple things. A transistor is even, although that gets into the micro stuff. So many things are simple, a gyroscope, the electric motor, they try to do motors for years. And finally, one guy got the commutators right. Uh, even the internal combustion engine, it had a couple of tricks, uh, the, the, the camshaft. Uh, the multiple valve cylinders, 
uh, on and on and on, but it, it has about five, six, seven tricks, even a bicycle procession. And the way the the the, the, can, the cantilevered uh, wheels and so on. So these are all things. Once we get it, it's simple, and we understand it. But it was this trick. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up, I have ten more, but I won't talk. Is the concept that people must die in order for to have progress. People must die. And the reason why they must die is I remember in the early days I did the first instrumentation on an airplane. And uh, it was to just simply do the fuel tank. And it was done by wire. And it was to measure the fuel in a fuel tank. And this old guy at Boeing opposed it and opposed it and opposed it. We were doing it for S Simmons Precision. And all of a sudden, I get the call one day, he died. So now we can move forward. And so when you're talking about these organizations and these peer review boards, they consist of people. And these people are, are dead in their ways. And they're super opposed things. And they make things not happen. And they're powerful people. They've got to die. In fact, who said this was wrong? <laughs> You're not going to get new physics until enough people so, die. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, Garrett, does that answer your question as to why you guys are all so conservative? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. I mean, that seems like a good social factor in the whole conservative nature of academia, which I you know, you guys got to be right, though. I mean, if you're wrong about something, man, you get run over the coals. Well, yeah. Even so. Yeah. Even so. Can we freshen the way that we speak? I mean, sometimes <laughs> even just rearranging the way that we discuss items and frame our questions can make a huge difference in solving. And I find this to be true. You know, I hear the same things repeated again and again and again. I've listened to all of the sessions these five days and people speak about light in the same way. They, they quote this law, this rule, that law. And I hear you all phrasing things the same way every time you say it. And I just challenge you to think about the way that you're speaking about fundamental energy and light and perhaps reframe some of your questions. Um, I encourage you to watch all of the talks over these past five days, catch up with some truly fantastic, really good ideas. And Charles recorded an intro yesterday that's at the top of our uh, blog page. And I would read that. I would listen to that too. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I um, want to get that in. Let me ask, are there people who haven't spoken yet uh, this afternoon who have some comments? I think uh, some people may be quiet, but have something to say. Okay. Uh, it looks like okay. Jack Sarfati has, has a comment. So, uh, Bob, Bob Bruick, I will have uh, something to say. Uh, I think Jack, I was, uh, Jack Sarfati, are you trying to say something? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. Can't hear you. Okay. No? okay. Shall I speak? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm actually, oh, no. sorry, I'm trying to get Jack Sarfati to, to speak, but it, hello? Oh. Jack, the mute button's on the bottom left of the bezel. No, it's not working. Okay, carry it. Uh, yes, is, is there somebody else who ha hasn't spoken today? I just want to. Bob Bruick, I'm not a part of your panel. I have not spoke. Please. Can I share just a couple of observations or questions? Uh, go ahead, Bob. Um, I have followed this work since 2006 when I went to a symposium that uh, Dr. Sheehan had out in San Diego. Uh, my motivation has been different. It's been to see where physics needs to be extended to take into the support of uh, paranormal and, and non-locality kind of situation. So uh, if measurements of energy violating the second law all use language and terminology of a closed system if system is not closed and for instance there is a zero point field existing then there's no surprise that there is violation of this second law the issue to me is one of uh, is time uh, really, as we have assumed it with this simultaneous 
energy and photon exchange in in causality uh, or is time really a, a duration and at the Planck limits of 10 to the minus 44 we aren't even close to examining what the limit is in our own model which right now the best measurements I've been informed of are about 10 to the minus 23. And everything that's been discussed today has been pretty slow stuff. Okay, so and did you have a Jack's up? Jack's ready to go. Okay, yeah. Jack. So uh, uh, a couple of things, uh, has anybody considered, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. What, what happens when you uh, make a Carnot engine with a negative spin temperature coupled to a classical positive temperature? What's the efficiency? <laughs> Tell us. Check that one out. Turns out <laughs> you have 100%. It turns out that heat is sucked according to the second law, according to you know, classical second law, the Carnot equation. Uh, heat is sucked out of both reservoirs and converted entirely into work. It's not a violation of second law. It is the second law. <laughs> but with negative, negative, you know, quantum spin temperatures and is a quantum effect. So, uh, uh, but <laughs> have, have any of you thought about that? How do you build one? Yeah. How do you set up? How do you set what? up a system that uh, has the negative spin temperature that is separate? Uh, from a positive uh, well that's a good well I don't yeah that's a good that that's a good question well the second law is uh, an experimental is, statement I'm just mm -hmm. going I'm just going over the uh, what the mathematics says I mean I'm not you mm -hmm. know figure out an experiment that's why it should be impossible well is there some law of nature saying you cannot um, you know the spin degree you can't couple the spin degrees of freedom to the lattice degrees of freedom so I think it's called spin orbit coupling I think you should be able to do that yeah but 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 spin spin orbit coupling and, and uh, spin temperature, I liken to electron temperature, which is uh, a, a different class of thermodynamic thing. I don't see why. No, I don't see why. I don't say. I mean, you know, I have faith in the mathematics. I'm a theoretical physicist. I see the equation says. I mean, it's an experimental issue. I mean, I don't I don't see why it should be a fundamental law that you cannot uh, run a Carnot engine between a negative and a positive temperature. Uh, so I think the I answer you can, but it's not obvious you can't. You can. So I think the answer here is that really theorists ought to be building things rather than. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know, but, but I did. <laughs> okay, there is a book. There's a Zemansky, Dover. There's an old book by Zemansky. You know, Sears and Zemansky, and he talks about uh, uh, Carnot engine between two negative temperatures, mm -hmm. but he doesn't talk about positive and negative. So it's in Zemansky's you know, standard textbook from years ago that, that uh, there's a Carnot engine with, between two negative temperatures. So I don't see any fundamental, uh, you know, just yeah. not, not to, okay. The other thing is uh, about uh, the other uh, change topic uh, about the real and virtual particles. It wasn't Garrett was asking, uh, you know, is it he with the cotangent formula they unified, and uh, yes, the uh, Hawking evaporation of black holes and the you know, unruh, uh, the distinction between virtual particles and real particles is not invariant under um, inertial, a uh, non-inertial frame transformation to general relativity. Um, in other words, if you have a particle detector that has a proper acceleration, you know, it's, a, it's really accelerating relative to the gravitational uh, metric field, um, it sees a, a these black body radiation that depends upon its um, its proper acceleration, you know, yeah. off a geodesic path. So, uh, so that means that you know, the inertial observer will see just zero point photons, but the guy next to him who's accelerating will see some of these virtual photons become real photons. I guess because you know there's an external force on the detector is doing work, so it's providing the energy to to upgrade the uh, the virtual photons into real photons. So, um, so the distinction, I mean, the general, the, the, the distinction between real and virtual particles is not an absolute distinction. 
it's, it's contingent on acceleration of the detector. So I think that's uh, relevant to what Garrett was uh, asking. Yes, thank you. Um, Jean Kidman had, uh, you, you had your hand up. Yes, um, so uh, I'm a chemical engineer and uh, I've been interested in energy for some time. I did an analysis on a, a reaction that really brings a, an interesting thought about entropy. Um, uh, in this reaction I, I, I analyzed, it was a reaction by Santilli uh, done on what he calls intermediate fusion. And I, I uh, was able to find with a high degree of accuracy there was a that there was a tremendous amount of uh, transmutation. And I was able actually from the, from the mass balance uh, able to show uh, a chemical reaction equation. It was that it was that precise. But the, the weird thing about it uh, was that about four ten thousandths of the energy that would be predicted by that mass uh, loss uh, shows up as heat, and the rest, well, who knows what happens to it? <laughs> Which brings up the crazy question: simply that the possibility that there is something that composes entropy that has nothing to do with this concept of order and disorder, but is actually perhaps some kind of mass or energy that uh, comes off the reaction. Uh, um, Daniel, did you have a thought about this? Okay. Um, so I there would be a there would be a very nice Carla gene to that because entropy can be either the physics view of entropy or it can be the Shannon view, informational view of entropy and the twain should never meet. Um, I have a story I could tell you as Shannon was dying when he told me why he never connected the two, but we don't have the time for that. But at any rate, what you're alluding to is uh, is that the uh, entropy uh, takes on a form right now of, of information disorder, and it might have a correlate into a physical form. Yeah. Yes, that's true. In fact, uh, there have been measurements made by the, the Russians of something they call uh, strange radiation, where they capture this radiation that they can block um, as far as light is concerned. And it, it, and it gets trapped because of its momentum in water and then can be forced back out of the water by a, a laser. And it creates some kind of uh, interaction with an emulsion or a film. And so they, they've got these strange radiation tracks that's what they what, what they call it and beyond that who knows what the devil it is but yeah i think there's some there's some interesting uh data out there suggesting the possibility that there is some other form uh, of mass or energy than what we than what we understand through the standard models or through standard radiation uh, even even a lot of the eleanor stuff they get into talking about there's a guy called Rue, uh, who went through and analyzed the radiation off of it and was not able to classify it into any one of the um, normal classes for the radiation off of those Eleanor reactions. So I th thank you. Um, I think you're pointing to more questions than answers, which I think is what our whole discussion today did. And I've got a strong feeling this is not going to be the last time we convene to discuss these issues. So how, how about it's, one it's last question, to, Garrett? So, uh, how it, how I, about when, when does Gen 4 arrive? Make a yeah. Generation 4. Of what? Second law devices. I see. OK. Uh, let's, next time we meet, we'll have them. <laughs> OK. Uh, you, you, you and I will be in production with our devices. Uh, uh, so anyway, I'd like to, I, it, it's time. I don't want to, I, okay. I, I know there's a lot more to, to say, but I think we'd better okay. uh, call it at this point. All right. And, uh, thank you very much for your participation and interest. Um, there's, as I said, much more to, to pursue, which I, I'm sure we will do in future conversations. Uh, Charles, do you have uh, any final comments? 
Yeah, thank you, Garrett. And, you know, really appreciate you uh, joining us this year in the Society for Scientific Exploration. And it's been a wonderful set of talks on this last day of our conference. And, um, you know, I just want to say we've had 29 talks throughout the, the five days and near as I can tell about 150, maybe 175 different participants. So although, you know, it's unfortunate we couldn't meet in person at MIT where you have those really strong heart to heart conversations. Um, I think there's other benefits to the Zoom meeting where more people can participate and, uh, and that as well. And I just, you know, I think our questions are key, right? What are the questions that we're asking? And um, someone had a quote that, you know, once, once um, you ask the right question, uh, the answer is obvious. And I, I wish I remember who said that. It was someone who had taught him that. And I think we could look at reframing what we're doing by carefully considering the words we use. You know, how do the words we use limit our conceptions? Because words are reductionist, right? The thoughts in our head, uh, we speak some words, they don't really reflect the thoughts in our head. And we use words, you know, kind of willy nilly and they're baked in and it bakes in an idea. So, you know, I think we could really consider the words we're using and we need to be bold. You know, I go back to Jim Jeske's uh, Dragon King events uh, and situation that could be happening. We really need to be bold. It's not a time to be conservative. And many of us are at, you know, the age of reason, right? Where, okay, we're, you know, at the age where it's time to just really do what our heart says and, you know, uh, and all the other sort of things be damned. Um, and, you know, so I would encourage people to, you know, who didn't have a chance to take a look at all the videos or online and, uh, you know, we, I just wanted to list, you know, we talked about the forcing function. We talked about light and EM. We talked about vacuum fluctuations. We covered some new theories from different viewpoints. Uh, we talked about testing of some of these uh, unusual devices. And uh, today we talked about second law violations. So I, I always believe that it's through this multidisciplinary, multi viewpoint sort of thing that maybe we can come up with new conceptions, new ideas that we can then go off and, and make something happen. So, you know, finally, I just thank everybody for participating and everyone who gave talks. And, uh, you know, I just uh, really love the open discussions and, and everyone seeking things out there. You know, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for organizing and thank everybody for being bold and sharing. Yeah, thank you. Great work. Thank you, Charles. Okay. Thank you, Charles and Garrett. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Garrett. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Charles, for everything. Yeah, it was amazing. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I look forward to seeing you all in person next year. Be well. Yes. Yes. Be daring. Be brave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Charlie, I think to move on from here, I think, uh, you know, education is most important. I think, you know, publish some of the papers. And Daniel, I actually also uh, edit a special issue in energetics. So academic, advanced uh, thermodynamic and type B energy process. Anyone interested in submit paper will be great uh, uh, welcome. And then we need to educate because it's the, 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 the resistance in the, the, the scientific community is very strong because they don't understand. We need to better educate. Thank you. Yes. That's my yes. point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyone here from Massage, is, is anyone have a discovery uh, top B energy processes, uh, communicate with me, email me, and we will very uh, happy to very uh, open mind look into your discovery and uh, keep communicating with, with the scientific society better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Okay, well, hopefully we can meet in person next year. <laughs> yeah, Ch uh, Charlie and Emma and, and Professor Model, thank you. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> good session. <laughs> right. Really nice session. Yeah. All right, take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye, Charles. Bye, bye um, Garrett. Goodbye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Charles, can you send the recordings to Annalisa? Um, well, you know, they're super huge. Uh, you know, they're going to, maybe she can pick them up off of YouTube and download them, or uh, maybe there's a Dropbox way. I'm not very good at that. Um, okay. I'll ask her to, to initiate. Yeah, I'm not really sure the best way to do that. Okay. Excuse me, Charles, I can weigh in on that. Garrett, she can definitely download them from our YouTube channel. Uh, if she has a downloading software, you're welcome to do that. It's all open source. And if you'd like the videos intact, they are very large files, but uh, I can do Dropbox or something like that if you just want the files. Uh, just okay. let me know. My email is kate at unlab.us, and I'll put that in the chat. Okay, thank you. Hmm? Charles, Kate, is there any chance of getting PowerPoints and PDFs for we folks who do things in nonlinear order? Well, you know, that's, uh, I'm going to be asking the speakers who would uh, allow their, their, presentations to be put up on our website. So we'll see. Uh, you know, I put my charts up there. So <laughs> that's something. Uh -huh. Really great thing. Yeah, yeah I can do mine one. Uh -huh. No problem. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's support that. I think if we sent that, if you sent out a formal request to do so, they might be much quickly forthcoming and then you can put them up on your website. Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm definitely going to do that, Robert. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 29 hours of video is a bit much rather than randomly looking for good stuff in PowerPoint. <laughs> All right. You can't text search a video as yet. Robert, we have transcripts of the chats too that I can email you. Well, that would be wonderful. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah, we can I'll, what I'll do is I'll, get you, I'll get you back a diagram that summarizes all the connectivity. How do you like that? I like everything about it, and I can't wait to see you again. Thanks for participating. Terrific. Ditto. Thank yeah. you so much. Take care. Very, Be well. The consciousness um, uh, research. Yeah, say that again, Jacek. Pardon? Jacek. If you want to pronounce my Polish uh, first name, is Jacek. You know? Jacek. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> yes, yes. Jacek. Jacek. <laughs> Uh -huh, uh -huh. You have to spell it phonetically. Or Jack. Jack is, also right. <laughs> Jack is okay. Yasek, okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, back to the root of the of our of this um, master who is uh, researching. So you can experience something very, very beautiful. This zero entropy. Zero entropy. It's perfect harmony, beauty, love, compassion, everything. It's just this light, perfect harmony, zero entropy. I assure you, it's something different to think it out as to experience it directly from the guts. Yes. yes, it's possible. Yes. And then this multiple unlimited functions of our mind states just open for everything, the essence from everything. And we have to dissolve the um, <clears throat> the mental barrier between spirituality and science it, it happened in our history several several um centuries ago as the science appeared emerged so i said no religion it's not reasonable it's not common sense just science not outer outer and we forgot the master who is the master and we can go the both direction i was struck by Gerrit as he told me as he said yeah 
I'm not, I'm percep, I'm personally, I'm not a professional in, in quantum in, um, theory, but he said in, in the quantum uh, region, there is zero entropy, right? Zero, perfect harmony, perfect. So uh, this uh, second low valuation, <laughs> we are this, violation <laughs> <laughs> i am with you 100 yeah. percent yes uh-huh so i was i was taking uh, there is a team uh, i think in australia our uh, spiritual um teacher in berlin sent me a mail uh, if i could uh, put a questionnaire about my experience in um, in my meditation and I just, I just uh, wrote down this process. Several, several uh, uh, months, uh, it was actually September, several months uh, later, I became the, the, uh, the letter from, from this um, uh, the man who organized this for the scientists. And he, he was so grateful so my account was so uh, um, so uh, valid for him, and um, uh, and they pushed these uh, uh, research much forward. And there are many forgotten uh, treasures in our culture, in our exp experience, that we forgotten, and it is tragic, tragic, really. Yes. We have to go back to this, to this experience. Yes. Join science with spirituality. Yes. So we can only then we will go forward. But I see you all folks say about your experiences, and ex I, I I I see it. It goes in this perfect harmony. In this uh, sea ocean of energy, of beauty of freedom, of everything. Yes. This is our home. We are longing to get there. Yes. There's no death. There's no death. We are, we are, when we lose this body, we'll get another one. And yes. the point is to get the right one. And this, and this is a karma. You, you have to avoid evil to good, good thing and to help others. It's key points of everything or our success as humanity. That's yes. it. Yes. That's and it. And I love you all. And, and we're all part of that. We are a part of that. That perfect entropy. No and, entropy. Right. We're, is, we're, <laughs> that is our, us. That is us. Yes. We are part of this entropy. We are this entropy. We are this entropy. Yes, sir. We are this entropy, right? Yes. See you. Yes. Send me an I, email or something, please. Yes. I, I have, I had a, a idea. A, a, a last day was so exciting for me. I couldn't sleep until yes. two at night. <laughs> Same idea. Let's, let's set up the assumption of true physics. I will write down and, and, and send you. How do you feel about it? Yes, please do. Because, because I see in my intuition, it goes with this, so, so, so the quasi axioms of, of being. Time is being. No time, no being. Right. Yes, and then you know, there's the <laughs> the universe where there is no time. I mean, that is there is a place where you can be where there is no time, and all all of time is there at at once. But this is one aspect. The second aspect of the void is a function of our entropy, and these functions are limitless. This, 
That's why there are so limitless this failure the other had. The last question, why do we have so many, so many failures? Because there are many functions in our mind. This is only one mind. It tries this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. It is everything okay. Without failure, you wouldn't be wiser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're here to experience. Yes. So go forward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. It was yes. really, really inspiring. Yes. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Charlie, sometimes in the maybe sometime when you have time, can I have an individual meeting with you maybe uh, a few weeks, a weeks later, or sometime when you are convenient? Yes, certainly. Oh, yes, yes. that would be I wonderful. Want to chat with, I would like to chat with you maybe on Zoom. We can schedule something, right? Okay. Yes. When you feel, yeah, okay. Thank okay, you. that would be wonderful. It's a Thank wonderful you, session. Yes, I think it's wonderful. Thank Girls. you. Yeah. Yes, Girls, one last bureaucratic tech tech thing. One thing that's missing from this year that was very much always there the first three years is you had a list of contact info. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we don't, I, so can you pull together everybody's contact info? Yeah, so we tried to gather everyone's we email and we're going to be putting that together. Email, and you need phone, uh, phone nowadays. Yeah, that would be helpful. All the follow-ups after this meeting. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that will be That'll very be helpful. Yes, <laughs> contact information, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, both of you. I mean, wonderful. I think. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah thank uh, you. Uh, contact information very helpful. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. To move on from here. Mm -hmm. Gennady, did you have something you would like to say, or uh, me? No, no. Gennady is uh, oh, seems Gennady. to be here, uh, mm -hmm. listening. I don't know. I just wanted to give you a chance. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Right, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hang up now. Take care, everyone. Such a pleasure. Bye, Robert. So nice hearing you again. Yes, we will be meeting. For yes. Sure. Yes. Take care of my good friend, Evan. Yes, we will. Boy, that's going to be fun, isn't it? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You can imagine how excited I am. At 24, he's going to become a man. That's great. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. And he'll get to play he's tennis going nuts over the car. He loves the carriage house. I think that was so great. So great. Oh, nice. He's isolated, no roommates. I tell them this is the ideal life you want. Skip over roommates, you know? Yeah, yeah. For an introverts like us, it's perfect, right? Yes, and, uh, yes. He's only a mile and a half from our house, and he's right in between our house and the tennis courts. And so uh, he's going to, he's oh, a know, karate. This is ideal. This he'll is miss ideal. karate, but he'll play tennis Maybe with us. Maybe he can find a new he'll, karate he'll find, spot. He'll, find, he'll, he'll yeah. find a club down there, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, he'll find it. it. Might be twenty miles away, but he'll find a club. He's got such so unique really intelligence. Yeah, yeah. The fine. main, the main, the main. My main job the last six months, which was very successful, was getting him off video games. Getting him off what? Video games. Video. Oh. <laughs> video games. He loves his video games. Yes, he does. Well, since no, we're going to no, be building, since we're going to be building the model, one of the ideas is to make it enjoyable like a game. So his love of gaming will probably actually come in handy. It'll That's come in handy in the model we're designing, yes. All right, well, let's go make dinner. Yeah, and Diane, I just wanted to say I like your thought. Yay, let's be the violation. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs> so nice to see you, Robert.